as Naipaul's work soared into success at every level, in every era. A whole other generation of Caribbean writers were watching from back home, learning and hoping to one day follow his path. The Nobel Laureate in Literature, Sir V.S. Naipaul. The climax of Naipaul's story, which came in 2001 when he was named the Nobel Laureate in the field of literature, raised the entire profile of not just Trinidad and Tobago, but also the Caribbean. Like the old-fashioned comedian, the man, you know, to whom things happened on the way to the studio. Well then, something happened to me on the way to Stockholm. The strap of my wristwatch broke. And for some surreal moments, I found myself looking at my watch on the floor of the plane. This is no metaphor. Here is the strapless watch. <laughs> what did it mean? What was the awful symbolism? The fact that all through this grand Nobel week, I was to be without my watch. The great Caesar, landing in Egypt, fell flat on his face on the wet shore. You can imagine the consternation of his officers until the great and resourceful man shouted, Africa, I've got you. <laughs> <laughs> Some centuries later, the Emperor Julian, training one morning with his soldiers, lost the wicker part of his shield. He was left holding only the grip or the handle. How terrible for everybody, until the Emperor shouted, What I have, I hold! <laughs> Not having the resourcefulness of these great men, I could find no words to make the bad symbolism good. Until tonight, when I understood that time was the stop for me during this Nobel week, and that when it began again, it would be truly new. Now, my strapless watch, benign again, tells me without threat that my time is running out. My two minutes are up. At the height of Naipaul's career, Nalo Hopkinson's was just taking off. She was the recipient of the 1999 John Campbell Award for Best New Writer and the Ontario Arts Council Foundation Award for Emerging Writers. She also featured at the 2019 Bocas Literature Festival. Did he have any specific impact on your writing? He did because I read Miguel Street a million times um, when I was much younger. Um, afterwards, when I would read Naipaul's um, opinions on women and, you know, and so... I didn't really check for that too much. Um, so I would go back to Miguel Street <laughs> when it seemed like he still had an, uh, uh, an eye for humanity when he didn't seem like he hated people so much, frankly. <laughs> Marlon James, too, was in Trinidad and Tobago for the event. Did V.S. Naipaul have a great influence in your life? Uh, and if he did, what type of impact did he have? Um, of course he had a big influence. He had an outsized influence in, in many ways. I think um, on, a very, on, on a purely structural level, again, the economy, the writing about the world you're from, the being right in the middle but somehow outside of the language. And I think that's one of the things that makes Naipaul a universal author is that to, to write that kind of book, the book that, that goes beyond, say, the local subject, you have to be outside and inside at, this, at the same time. And it's something that you just, you don't learn overnight and you don't, you're not born with it. And, um, and he was a rigorous craftsman in that way and his, his prose was, was sparkling. Not coincidentally then, James himself has an extraordinary desire for writing on topics that are much bigger than the Caribbean, and perhaps even outside of it. At the same time, I do think Naipaul is one of those writers who, at a certain point, jettisoned his own lyricism. Because um, in a free state, or, or let's pick another novel, uh, A Bend in the River and The Mimic Men might as well be two different authors. Authors evolve, of course, but I think um, there's a lesson in, in the reading those two novels back to back about the choices an author makes as they grow 
and um, in, you're in the talent. Both are brilliant books, but they're very different books. And according to Dr. Maraj, Naipaul didn't only blaze a trail for writers like Hopkinson and James, but also people from around the world. Just as well, his contribution to the way we live in the Caribbean cannot be underestimated. So I remember the first time I heard, I read um, this fellow, Vijay Mishra. He's a professor in a university in Australia, and he's written quite a bit about um, Naipaul. And he was saying that he has learned to see and to think because of reading Naipaul. And many of us have learned to do that. It has helped us to live in a particular way. It has helped us to um, formulate what kind of work we want to do in a particular way. It has made us create, in my case, create particular kinds of students, help them to see in a certain way. And that makes for an ability to live within circumstances that are not, um, that are not seldom the best. But let's not get it wrong. As much as Naipaul shaped and influenced writers from around the Caribbean, the Caribbean also played an important role in shaping his writing. In fact, it would be the foundation blocks he would build his empire of books on. He spoke at length about this in his Nobel lecture. When I became a writer, those areas of darkness around me as a child became my subjects. The land, the Aborigines, the New World, the colony, the history of the colony, India, the Muslim world, to which I also felt myself related, Africa, and then England, where I was doing my writing. That was what I meant when I said that my books stand one and the other, and that I am the sum of my books. That was what I meant when I said that my background, the source and prompting of my work, was at once exceedingly simple and exceedingly complicated. In the same way that he said that he was the sum of his books, he also said the island had given me the world as a writer because all of the elements that he would later travel and find in the broader world were present here first. Professor Morgan attributes many of Naipaul's greatest and perhaps most unique characteristics that he's dazzled the world with as being developed right here in the Caribbean. His, his act of being a restless wanderer because he wanders the world looking at, looking at it with an acerbic vision. What we will call, he look at it with cokey eye. He had a cokey eye look, but that cokey eye that, that, that he brought to his broader world was definitely honed right here. Satirical, uh, cynical, um, his use of language, so sharp, so precise. He honed all of that right here. I mean, Naipaul is a kind of Calypsonian. His wit, his satire is very much honed right here. The professor admits as well that as much richness as the Caribbean offered Naipaul, it is also the source from which many of his perceived arrogance and ignorance would have stemmed. There was a time at which I found his work simply too painful to read. And it, it was very difficult for me to read at a point. But then later, when I came back to it, I saw it as, as reflecting a kind of damage in the psyche that was his, but it's only his because it's ours. It's not his because he is a particularly repugnant you know, creature. It is his because the incidents of our history has damaged us. And, and, and he has been very frank about the nature of the damage. He talks, he says this is a colonial backwater. But when he goes to Oxford, he criticizes Oxford as a very small and mean place. When he goes to Africa, he certainly has his say. When he goes to India, he quarrels about that too. Just like his books, Naipaul was indeed a man of differing characters. In fact, the late British literary editor, Diana Athill, who published Naipaul's books and edited some of his work, had to enjoy him the most. Seeing him in a friendly way had been exhausting because he gets terribly depressed or used to get desperately depressed between each book. He used to go into a fearful gloom and one used to have to spend so much one's time trying to cheer him up and really people's depressions are very, very taxing to other people. When we come back, 
the controversial side of the man that left the public split on whether to love him or hate him. I think Naipaul's hatred of Trinidad is very, very real.